I want to begin today by welcoming uh, all of you that are watching via our broadcast at the Blue Valley, Lee Summit, and Olathe campuses. And uh, wherever you are, I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. And if you'll just uh, get your Bible open and keep it open there as we make our way through this text, I guarantee you'll get, you'll get way more out of it. And uh, next time you're in this passage in your own Bible, uh, you'll have some words underlined and, and some things will come to mind. Today in Jonah 4, we come to the final chapter of the story and the final message in the series that we've been in. Thus far, we have seen Jonah run from God in blatant disobedience. We've seen God chase after Jonah and, and via a storm and a great fish chastise him. And then after three days in the belly of the fish, we see Jonah finally surrender to God, obey to God, and go preach to the Ninevites, which led to perhaps the greatest revival in all human history. And if we just stopped right there at the end of chapter 3, Jonah would appear to be one of the greatest prophets, one of the greatest preachers of all time. Unfortunately, that is not how this story ends. And while almost everyone in our culture and world has heard the story of Jonah and the great fish, it seems there are very few that know the rest of the story, the story of Jonah and the plant and the worm and the wind. But I suspect, after spending a whole lot of time in this book for the last month or so, I suspect that the lessons that we are going to learn today from chapter 4 are in the mind of God, the truly essential ones, Certainly, they are the climactic lessons of this whole story. Well, let's begin today by just considering the surprising fury of Jonah. In response to God's, now get this, in response to God's gracious decision to spare the Ninevites, not to destroy them, chapter 4 begins, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And I just want you to underline the word exceedingly. It's going to pop up again and again. And one of the things you're going to learn about Jonah is he's maybe like some of us, a man of extremes. It displeased him exceedingly. What was it? That God was not going to destroy the Ninevites, that he was going to spare them, that he was going to save them. Jonah's not a happy camper. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? And this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Now, I'm not sure I believe that. I think there's some other things that, about why Jonah disobeyed God and went the other way. But this is what he says. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please just take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. This is an amazing thing. In Jonah chapter 2, when Jonah got out of the fish, he praises God to show, for showing mercy to himself. But here, he throws this little timber tantrum about God showing mercy to others. There's some hypocrisy here. Jonah was furious, and think about it, that God would even think about forgiving the Ninevites because he hated these people. And think about this. This whole time he's just preached this great revival's occurred. What you have here, you have a preacher who's walking around delivering the message that God has given him, but secretly in his heart, he's hoping that no one's going to listen to his message and that no one will be saved. I think there are many people in our culture today, and you've all heard this, they, they ask the question, how can a loving God possibly allow bad things to happen to good people? And of course, the Lord's answer to that question is, no one is good. That's the wrong question, right? The harder question, and this is actually the one that Jonah is asking, is how could a God who is holy, who claims to be just, ever forgive bad people? And this is a question that is often asked today by those who have suffered or seen up close human atrocity. Jonah knew what kind of people the Ninevites were. He knew them well. And so Jonah appoints himself as God's theological advisor, and he makes it clear to the maker of heaven and earth that he personally does not approve of how he's running things. And we may wonder how in the world could a prophet of God who's been through all the things that Jonah's been through develop such a bad attitude. 
But I think if we are honest, we kind of all have to admit that the only thing unusual about Jonah here is that he very stupidly verbalized all of his inappropriate thoughts, right, and feelings. Jonah, no doubt, is the kind of guy who would post everything he thought on Facebook today, and continually he's getting himself in trouble. The truth is, for all of us, when we repent of sin and, and we make a pledge to follow God in our lives, even today for us who have the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, just doing that, just going through that repentance, making that pledge, it doesn't make any of us to instantly know God's will perfectly, to understand it even after we know what it is, much less to fully obey everything that God has commanded, right? I mean, it's one thing to want to do it, it's another thing to know it and understand it and actually do it. That's not my experience. I know that I love Jesus and in my heart of hearts, in the core of my being, I want to I wanna live a life that pleases Him, but always knowing exactly what He wants me to do. And then when I do know it, actually understanding why He would ask me to do that and then actually doing it, it's still a struggle. And so if you're here today and, and you're like Jonah and you're like me and sometimes you find yourself struggling to know or to understand or to always feel and always act rightly, I want to tell you, you need to stay in the fight. That's because you're struggling. It's not reason to give up. You need to stay in the fight to keep trying to do the right thing. But you shouldn't get too discouraged because you're actually in very good company. I mean, even the great apostle Paul spoke about the constant struggle within him between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit. And, and all of us have these these two natures that are waging war within. So never let the fact that you're struggling with what God wants you to do, that your carnal nature is trying to exert its influence, never let that cause you to doubt that God's saving grace is working in your life. I love uh, the quote from C.S. Lewis from the book Mere Christianity. He said, when a man is getting better, when you're growing in your faith, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. You see, the very fact that maybe you're concerned today about your attitude, about your struggle with sin, the fact that you're concerned and maybe broken over that might be one of the best proofs that God's working in your heart, that his sanctification process is, is on schedule. Well, inside of Jonah's uh, furious outburst are two vital lessons for us. Number one, we should never ever do what Jonah did here and misuse the Bible to justify our inappropriate emotions. You see, when Jonah said to God, I knew you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in love, he was actually quoting directly God's own words from Exodus chapter 34 verse 6 back to God. Now, if you go study that text, you'll find that Jonah conveniently omitted verse 7. When God reminded Moses that, look, even though I am a God of mercy who's quick to forgive, I am also a God who never, ever lets the guilty go unpunished. I am a just God, and I am a gracious God, and you may not understand how that's all going to work out, but trust me, it's going to work out. But you see, Jonah is proof texting here. And he's actually accusing God of not being a just God, of not being the holy God he claims to be, of being soft on sin. And uh, he's proof texting, and a lot of people do this. They'll, they have an opinion, they have something they want to press, and they'll use the Bible, and often they'll argue against other things in the Bible that God has said that they don't like, but they'll try to pit God's words against himself rather than take them both and harmonize the passages and have a full understanding of the nature and will of God. They try to, to get God to argue with himself and use God to do what they want to do. They misuse Scripture to justify their own beliefs or behaviors or feelings about how things should be. This is what Jonah does here. We should never do that. Lesson two, we must never as Jonah was, be guilty of withholding from others the same mercy that God has given to us. Jonah here acts exactly like the unmerciful servant that Jesus talked about in his parable over in Matthew chapter 18. Do you, you remember that story? There was a great king and he forgave one of his servants a great debt. In fact, the Bible makes it clear it was a totally unpayable debt. It was a debt that could never be paid back. But this king forgives it completely. And yet that forgiven servant went out and was merciless toward those who owed him very, very small debts. 
And when the king heard of it, he was furious and he severely punished the unmerciful servant. Jonah had experienced great mercy, unprecedented mercy from the God of heaven. And yet he was so angry that God decided to show mercy to the Ninevites. Friends, when you and I refuse to forgive others the way the Lord has forgiven us, it's, it's a revelation that we do not yet understand what it means to be saved by grace. We don't understand the gospel, and we must never do that. Jonah's misguided fury is actually an amazing thing. And, uh, but what's even more amazing is the response and the compassion of God toward everybody. I've been thinking a lot about this, and uh, personally, I, I, I've, I've known the story of Jonah all my life, but I've never lived with Jonah the way I have for the last month. I've lived with him. And I really don't like him very much, right? I just don't think he's the kind of guy that I, I want to hang out with. Um, I do not want Jonah on my staff at the church. I, I don't want to ruin a perfectly good round of golf by having him in the foursome. It's just going to ruin it. I mean, I... Part of the thing is that there's some stuff about myself I see in him, and I don't like that in me, and so I sure don't like it in him. But this is just who he is. Think about who he is. Think about what we know about him. Earlier in the book, he is a disobedient, unfaithful coward. And I don't like people that aren't loyal, that aren't faithful, and that aren't coward. Now, I'm cowardly, and sometimes I'm unfaithful, but I don't like it in me, and I sure don't like it in him. He was a prophet of God. He represented God. He was to speak for God, and he disobeys God and runs the other way because he's afraid. I don't like that. And here in this text, you know what he is? He's an arrogant, ethnocentric racist. This man is a racist. He hates these people because of who they are, because they're not his people. And this is who he is. And he went and preached to them, but he didn't want them to get saved. He wants them to burn in hell. And those are horrible things, to be a coward and a racist. But what's most annoying here is that he is a pessimistic whiner. And it really bothers me. Have you noticed how many times, or you do notice it as we continue through the text, he says, oh, my life is so bad. Things are so bad. Just let me die. God, just let me die. Oh, over and over it happens. He's just, he's just this whiner. Uh, have you noticed, though, the, how God is such a contrast to that, how he's so consistent. And even though Jonah is this guy who we don't want to hang out with, God sees the great potential and value in him, and God never gave up on Jonah. In fact, at every point of Jonah's failure, God pursued him. He continued to chase after him. And even those terrifying chastisements of a storm at sea and a fish that swallowed him, those things were sent by God. They were designed by God to get his attention, to correct him, to redeem him, and to grow his faith. And I hear in this text, Jonah, now he's popping off. He's giving God advice. He's, he's popping off here. He, he's even trying, think about it. He's even trying to use God's own words against him to accuse God with his own words. And when I see that, I kind of go, whoa. I brace myself for what God's going to do to him with this, what the third great failure of his four chapters. And yet, again, God's response is shocking. God responds to Jonah's tirade with this very, gentle question and I love this question parents you need to write down this question because I wish I had thought about this question when I had teenagers at home men don't use this question with your wife I'll I'll show this to you it's not a good idea but it's the kind of question that a therapist would ask to to facilitate introspection look at it verse four the Lord said do you do well to be angry I mean someone's all angry about something "Eh, really really Is that your best and appropriate response to this situation? Do you do well to do angry? Jonah doesn't answer the question here. He's kind of rebuked by it. He's just silent. Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city. I think he stormed out of the city. He goes up to the east 
of the city. He gets up on this big hill. He makes a booth for himself there, and he sat under it in the shade until he should see what would become of the city. In other words, Jonah went and set up an awning and a lawn chair, and he pops some popcorn, and he sits down, and he's hoping against hope that God will change his mind and that he might actually get what he came for to see some fireworks, right? This is what he wants. But this time fuse on the prophetic bomb he dropped in Nineveh, it just never goes off. But then look at the compassion of God toward Jonah. Verse six, now the Lord God appointed a plant. He's sitting there with his shade, it's a hot day, appointed a plant, and it came up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. I want you to underline the word discomfort in your Bible. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. I mean, now he's exceedingly angry. Now he's exceedingly glad. This guy's moving. Most scholars believe that this plant was uh, because of the words that's used. Sometimes, some of your Bibles translate gourd. It, that's probably a bad image. That this is probably a castor oil plant because they grow really fast and could be seven, eight, nine feet and could pr provide shade and grow fast. And uh, uh, this part of the world in Iraq, modern Iraq, you would see these things. But I want you to note this, this word that I told you, underline the word here for discomfort. Some of your Bibles, it, it says distress. This is amazing. That's the exact same Hebrew word that is used to describe the wickedness and the evil of the Ninevites in Jonah chapter 1 verse 2 and in Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. Now friends, you think about this. Think about how this, how this word is being used in two different ways. Do you realize that sometimes when you are distressed or you're agitated, you're, you're discomforted, that really that's evil? You're feeling that, well, just the way I feel. No, you shouldn't feel that way. You're making a mountain out of a mohill. This is, this is evil that you're thinking that way, that you're feeling that way. The problem's not with your situation, environment. It's your response to the environment. It's your selfish, narcissistic spirit. That's the problem here. And Scripture, in this passage, it invites us to connect Jonah's discomfort or distress or agitation. We're supposed to connect that and see a parallel between that and Nineveh's evil immorality and violence. I say, really? Yes. You see, the Ninevites, no doubt about it, they did evil. They had a whole lot of horrible, bad, sinful behavior. They did wrong. But Jonah's attitude of discomfort, his distress, it reflected a bad and sinful heart. And when God is looking down at people, what's he look at? What's he look at? Well, he looks at our behavior, but God looks on the heart of a man, right? He looks at the source. In fact, with him, that's always the pressing issue. Isn't this what Jesus told us? Hey, it's not enough for you not to murder. I don't want you to hate your brother. It's not enough for you not to commit adultery. I don't want you lusting after women. It's, it's, this is the heart of God, and God looks on the heart. Jonah had a bad heart. Verse 7, when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah is such a drama queen. This, this is Jonah. <laughs> All right, Fuller, Fuller Seminary professor, Leslie Allen, he writes, the shoe that Jonah wanted the Ninevites to wear was now on his foot, and it pinched. Sometimes when we find ourselves in moments of deep grief and distress, like small things, like just one good thing, small comforts can kind of be sustaining for us. And and so <laughs> everything's going wrong for Jonah. Nothing's going the way he wanted it to go. But Jonah just wants to die because his shade plant had withered. And he whines about it. 
But God said, nothing's good in my life. Everything's bad. Everything, nothing's going the way it should. Everything's going bad for me. The only good thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life was I had this shade plant that grew up last night, and now you're taking even that away from me, God. Then let me die. It's ridiculous. Verse 9, God said to Jonah, here's the question again, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And this time Jonah stupidly answers, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And, and the Lord said, you pity, underline the word pity. It, it means to have compassion, to have, to have pity or compassion, to be deeply moved emotionally. You, you pity the plant for which, by the way, you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it, you had this sense of entitlement, I don't know where it came from. You did not labor for it, nor did you make it grow. I just gave it to you for the night. Why didn't you say thanks, I had it yesterday? Why? It came in a night, and it perished in a night, and you're, you're all upset about the plant. Should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which there were more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. You know what that means? They're preschoolers. There probably was over a million people living in, in Nineveh, but there was 120,000 among them that, that weren't old enough to know their left from their right. They're little children. They're babes. And, and Jonah wants everyone swept away. And, and also there's much cattle. You don't, you don't care about the people who did the sin. You don't care about the babies who haven't done anything wrong. You don't even care about the cows. You just care about the plant that provided shade for one day for you. The key word here is the word pity or compassion. And this, this word means to grieve or to be brokenhearted enough that you would actually weep over something or someone. And, and God basically says, seriously, Jonah, you, you're so attached, you're so emotionally tied to the plant that you're going to weep when it's taken away, when it dies. My compassion, my weeping is for lost people. And friends, God had wept. He wept over the evil and the lostness of the Ninevites. And how amazing that is that an unchanging, all-powerful, omnipotent God would allow himself to, to become so vulnerable that he could look at people that were drifting away from him and think about their future and be so moved with compassion that he would weep over them and, and the innocent children and even the animals. In the book of Hosea, God looked at Israel. He looked at his chosen people. And he sees them just, they're just walking away from him. They're, my children, they're just drifting into sin. They're drifting into wickedness. They're, they're doing what the Canaanites do. And, and his heart is broken, and he speaks with the, with the brokenheartedness of a, of a father of, of all prodigal children. Any of you parents that have ever had your kids just, just wander away. You know this pain. This is the heart of God toward, toward all prodigal children. And he says, how can I give you up? You're, you're moving away from me. You're sitting, do I just let you go, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? And the thought of just letting them go, my heart recoils within me. And my pity, my compassion grows warm and tender. I have to do something. But Jonah was more distressed about the shade than he was about the people God loves. I made a lot of fun of Jonah. I'm characterizing, caricaturing him a little bit. But do any of you relate to him ever? Have you ever been in your life, or maybe, honestly, are you now in some ways more guilty of caring about your own comfort than you are about the lives of others, and especially those who are lost? Be honest. I mean, where's lost people fit on your list of things that are important? Are you more concerned about your retirement account and your standard of living and your house and your car and your clothes and your entertainment than you are about the neighbors that live next door to you that without the intervention of God are on their way to a Christless eternity? Friends, what, what would it look like in our lives if we cared as much about people as we do our own comfort? What, whatever the source of that comfort is. Last week, 
you know, I was preaching on this, and I, I, I sat down, and I just kind of made a note that I was going to write stuff down, and I made a list as the week went on of the things that really agitated me or irritated me or caused me discomfort. And I was going to, I thought this was really good. I was going to share with you all the things that I was discomforted, just kind of a little confessional preaching, but I'm really ashamed of this list. I mean, I'm ashamed to share it with you. Some of the, I'm not going to share all of it with you, just a few that I'm less ashamed of, which tells you how bad the others are, right? But I, one of the biggest things that frustrated me this week, I just, I, I was, I was raging inside is that I had to go without Wi-Fi for 30 minutes. And it upset me. And I know I shouldn't share this. I must be a horrible person. I'm sure that I'm the only one in the world that, that had this thought. But I can't tell you how irritated I was. I was watching this movie and the weathermen kept interrupting my movie. I know they're trying to save lives and all, but when, when they went away to the movie, they come back, they did, like the movie doesn't stop there. I, I missed it. We're, and it was very irritating. I actually thought I'm probably the only person in the world that feels that way, but then a friend this week who heard the thurs me preach this sermon Thursday night, they sent me a video clip of a weatherman in Ohio that just went off and went into a big rant about the compassionless people who were all mad at him because they were missing the bachelor. The bachelorette or one, that's not what I was watching, okay? (laughs) Hey, I was distressed because my coffee was lukewarm. I, the biggest thing that it's, and this is an ongoing issue in my life, and it just sends me into a f- total frustration every time it happens, is when my wife wants a bite of my dessert. <laughs> so I'm telling you, for 40 years, this has been a problem. We, we go out, and we go to the restaurant, and we order, and, and I say, honey, I, you can have whatever you want, what do you, whatever you want to eat. Oh, I don't want very much. I'm not very hungry. Fine. You order it. We come to dessert, and usually she tries some of my stuff during my plate, but we come to the dessert, and I say, what do you want? I'll order anything you want. She goes, oh, I know I'm not going to eat any dessert. The dessert comes. Let me have a bite of that. <laughs> hey, if I wanted a half a dessert, I would have ordered half a dessert, right? And it just, I, I just, it just sends me off. I can't, in fact, I'm I'm ashamed of the ridiculous rage that I know that you may not see, but I know it's inside of me almost every time anything doesn't go exactly the way I think it should or wanted it to. I don't don't want you to know my heart there because I'm pretty sure it doesn't reflect the heart of God, but have you got anything like that in your life? I mean, what discomforts you? What are you whining about? to God. Friends, the heart of God is for people. And he is discomforted. He is distressed. He is frustrated. He weeps when people are lost and they are drifting further and further and further away from him. And I know today that God is saying to us about Kansas City the same thing he said to Jonah about Nineveh. He is saying, hey, you're supposed to be my people. What are you whining about? Why aren't you weeping with me over this this city? This image of God weeping over a city, I think it invariably draws us forward in Scripture to number three, the compassion or the pity of Jesus. The book of Jonah ends with God asking this great question. This is how it ends. Shall I not pity Nineveh, the great city? Isn't that appropriate for me? Isn't that a good thing? Does that not remind you of Jesus? Remember Jesus? Riding in Jerusalem, knowing he was soon to be rejected, mocked, beaten, tortured, and crucified by his own people, Jesus just kept weeping. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers chicks under her wing, but but you were unwilling And the Bible tells us as he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it saying, if only you knew, if only you knew what was coming. And the Bible says in Matthew, when he saw the crowds, he he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
You see, Jesus came to show us the heart of God, and he revealed that that God has a weeping heart. It's a heart filled with sorrow and with pity and with compassion for the lost. And Jesus is the model prophet. He's the prophet that Jonah should have been. I mean, Jonah, think of the contrast. He went outside of the city to root for its destruction. And Jesus went outside the city to die for its salvation. In his classic work, The Emotional Life of Our Lord, the great Princeton scholar B.B. Warfield says, the most frequent emotional word used to describe Jesus is the word compassion. It's this word pity. In the Greek, it's, it's the splagna. It's the word for guts. It's, splog, it's, it's a form. That's the root of it. And, and it's, it's the emotion you feel deep in your bowels. You feel it down there. And this is the emotional word most used to describe Jesus. And we saw it on the cross when he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You know what he said? He said, Father, spiritually, Forgive them, don't count this to their charge because they don't know their left hand from their right. Have mercy. But I have to point out that to the same men that were standing around mocking him earlier in the week, Jesus had said, the men of Nineveh will someday rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now one greater than Jonah is here. You see, it's because of Jesus and his coming and his work that we know that God looks upon all of us with compassion and that he longs to turn us from our sin and he longs to help us begin our journey back home to him. And don't, under, don't misunderstand, God is holy. God is holy and he is just and this is true. His, his wrath is kindled against all of the unrighteousness of men and those who suppress the truth. But the coming and the sacrifice of Jesus proves for us once and for all that God's basic disposition towards all of us who are lost sinners is at its very core, compassion. He has compassion for us. And it's interesting that even throughout Scripture, even when our holy and just God did exercise judgment and wrath he does not do that with pleasure he does that because his nature and character requires it the story of jonah ends with god's great question shall i not love this great city and i think the fact that that question is unanswered invites us today to consider our own compassion And God is saying here, not just to Jonah, but he is saying to every human being in all of human history, why why do you care so much about your comfort and not about people? I care for people. The good news is, with God's help, all of us can change. All of us can not be who we are, and we can become more like Christ. By the way, do, do you know the end of Jonah's story? Do you know what happened to Jonah after this book was over? Anybody know? Because if you raise your hand, you're going to tell it because the rest of us don't know, okay? <laughs> no, but nobody knows. Nobody knows what happened to Jonah. It just stops here with this question. And uh, there's been a lot of conjecture about it. But one of the things that most scholars do believe that Jonah the prophet wrote his story, that he wrote his own book. And those that don't believe it believe that he shared it with maybe someone like a contemporary prophet like Joel and that maybe Joel wrote the book. But Jonah is the source for the whole story. And I, I think to his eternal credit, Jonah did not stop the story in chapter three with him being the hero. He told the truth about himself. And it's ugly truth. In fact, I, I've been hard on Jonah. I would hate to be known for my worst day. He told the story. And further, He let God have the last word. He quit trying to self-justify and quit trying to argue. He let God have the last word. And this fact gives me hope that his life, maybe before it ended, was transformed. And I believe if God can change Jonah's cold and selfish, whining heart, then he can change mine and he can change yours. And 
I think the bottom line is the story of Jonah tells us that no matter how far we have run from God, he wants to and he can and he will bring us back and he will change our hearts and he will use us to do great things. I want to close our whole study with three quick action points. Friends, in light of God's great compassion for us and for people that are lost, in light of God's amazing grace at the cross, in light of God's call to us to have his heart, we first, we, we, this is a gut check for us, we have to be a people who forgive readily. We gotta get that, we gotta get that one right. There's so many people who claim to be Christ followers who for some reason have an extremely hard time letting go of hurts and grudges of the past. But friends, Jesus is crystal clear. If you come into church to worship and you remember your brother has something against you, you're to stop your worship and you're to go and be reconciled to your brother. Then you come back and you worship God. Do not be the unmerciful servant Jesus talked about, but imitate your Father who's in heaven, who's demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Obey the Lord and pray as he taught us to pray and forgive as you have been forgiven. Number two, I, here's a big takeaway. We gotta resist this temptation. We gotta resist the extremes of avoiding confrontation or of enjoying it too much. God sent Jonah to warn the Ninevites that he was going to smite them. But because of his compassion, he wasn't going to enjoy it. God wasn't going to enjoy it. He wanted to give them a chance to repent. I, but have you noticed that there's some people that seem to really enjoy preaching that rebuking message? They enjoy correcting people and criticizing things and telling you how your life should be. But even if you are doing those things and you're, even if the things you're saying is true, if you're not doing it with a heart of compassion, you're not being like God. On the other hand, if we are the kind of people who avoid speaking truth or criticizing or confronting others at all costs, we're, you're also being selfish because what you're showing is a lack of concern for the restoration of those that might be trapped in sin. Sometimes we have to risk the negative response to others to give them a critical message that they desperately need to hear. And when you're on the receiving end, I, I think I've learned that as we mature in faith, we learn to appreciate all loving criticism and loving correction. If I know those people are on my side, I appreciate even the painful things, the faithful wounds of a friend. Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I love that quote. Finally, I want to challenge you to let your heart be broken for those who do not know Christ. Friends, right now, who, who is your Nineveh? Who are the Ninevites in your life? Who are the people that you know God loves, but the truth is you don't. They're hard for you. We gotta remember that Jesus died for those people and um, what would happen if we all began to look at our city and our neighbors the way Jesus looked at Jerusalem, the way Jesus looks at our city and our neighbors. Brennan Manon writes, our hearts of stone become hearts of flesh when we learn where the outcast weeps. Every person under heaven was created in God's image for God's glory. And God loves all of his creation and he loves them so deeply that he sent Jesus to die. And he loves them so deeply that he's emotionally invested. He allows himself to be broken by their wavering, by their wandering. Ironically, I, I think it's insightfully, maybe you never thought about this, the last word in the book of Jonah is cattle. All right, this is what this says right here. But think, just think about that for a second. God even has concern for the cattle. That's what he tells Jonah. You don't even care about the cows. Jesus kind of talked about this, right? He said one time, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them falls to the ground outside of your father's care, his heart. 
And even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So do not be afraid, for you are worth many sparrows. You are worth way more than the sparrows and the cattle. Friends, today, God's heart is first to save and then to send all of His people to those He also loves and longs to restore. Father, we thank You for the story of Jonah. And Father, we thank You for uh, the encouragement in it and also, Lord, for the challenges. And I just pray, Father, that if, if there's one here that does not know You, that they would know today of your heart, of your compassion for them. And Father, for the rest of us, I, I pray that we would learn the lessons of Jonah, that we would be obedient, that we would speak truth in love to those you called us to go and speak to. And Father, I, I pray that you would change our hearts so that they might reflect yours. And Father, as we think about your compassion, we think about your grace, we think about your love for us and others, May that move us to praise and to worship every day in Jesus' name.